Um, this is the first time I have been in a room with this many people in an academic setting since March of 2020. 2020. Um, so it's both great and a little bit daunting. Um, and I'm a little bit worried about people being able to hear me toward the back speaking from the mask. Is this, am I okay? Great. I want to start us with a top 10 list. One, control the press. Two, dominate. To use a favorite word of what President Biden refers to as the former guy, dominate the historical narrative. Three, always support the truth, if not the war. Four, avoid a draft. Five, make sure body counts stay to one side. Six, if atrocities surface, double down on the bad apples. Seven, watch your language. It's never an escalation. It's just a search. Eight, if you get into trouble, up the ante. Here, think Cambodia. Nine, find some heroes, ideally some of whom are not POW MIAs. And 10, there is always a tactical path to victory, even when imaginary rather than real. These are the building blocks of the forever war that Marilyn Young sketches out for us in the short essay that we ask you to read for today's session. They are, she says, the lessons most policymakers appear to have learned from the Vietnam Wars. Marilyn, however, suggests we might learn a different set of lessons. She writes, quote, a bad war can't be fixed except by ending it. Failing to have dealt with old bad wars means repeating them. I'm delighted that we'll have some time together this afternoon to talk about the work of Marilyn Young, arguably the preeminent historian of war's place in American society, and that we can do this at such a crucial moment for thinking about the concept of forever war. I want to thank Mary and the center staff for putting this together, organizing it for us. I also want to thank Monica and Al for joining in. Both of them, like me, have had long engagements with Marilyn and her work, and we want to bring that to bear in the conversation and the discussion today. And I also want to acknowledge um, at the outset one of the elephants in the room, that our conversation today inevitably unfolds against the drawing down of the American war in that country. Monica and I were messaging back and forth about this, and it was hard for us not to think of Marilyn and what she has written about the legacies of April 30th, 1975 in Saigon and the fall of South Vietnam more generally as events were unfolding in Kabul last month. I want to take three directions in what will be very brief remarks. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about the genesis of the book, how it came together, as that's sort of bringing us into conversation today. Second, I want to lift up the centrality of the history of war in Asia for the critiques that Marilyn pioneered of the forever war. And finally, I want to conclude by considering the ways in which I'll call Marilyn's style offers a kind of scholarly model of engagement for all of us in what is a fraught moment through discourse in a variety of ways in this country. So to start with the book, Marilyn, who passed away too early from cancer in 2017, is perhaps best known as the author of the seminal 1992, The Vietnam War, essentially a synoptic history of the wars from 1945 through 75 and thereafter that. I've talked with that book many times. I'm guessing Al and Monica have done so too or engaged in it in a variety of different ways. And it may be a book that's familiar to many of you. But more broadly, Marilyn's trenchant and often deeply critical historical work on both US war and empire over the 40 years of her distinguished career found a wide admiring audience. Her writings moved across the 20th and early 21st centuries, making forceful interventions on the origins of American empire in East Asia, the relationship between the Cold War and the global processes of decolonization at mid-century, and the larger meanings of American wars in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Maryland's work remains startlingly relevant today. 
And so Mary Duziak, who was my co-editor for this volume, are hoping that the publication of Making the Forever War will enable her writings to be more easily accessible to a new and younger generation of scholars and students. Some of the selections, this is Monica's got the book too, but we can just, you know, hold up the show and tell. Um, some of the selections are published, and so they may be familiar to people as they're looking through. Others are unpublished and were among her papers that are now at NYU. So the idea was to put all this together in a kind of accessible package for people. It's a marvelous set of essays that together really bring Marilyn's bracing historical insight to some of the most pressing historical problems, but also some of the most pressing problems of our day. Why does US war never end? What are the origins of ongoing military conflict? How have American leaders justified their decisions about these wars? Why seemingly does the American public support the wars and how could opposition to them be so fractured? And finally, what are the consequences for countries and peoples on the receiving end of US wars? These are the kinds of big questions that emerge across the kind of work that Marilyn was doing. What I want to linger on here was the central place of Asian history for the development of Marilyn's larger approach to the notion of forever war. Marilyn, to be clear, did not claim to be an Asianist. She came to Asian history through the lens of American engagement in the region and what she came to learn about East and Southeast Asia along the way. As she later wrote about Vietnam, quote, it changed the shape of my moral world. Maryland scholarship spanned a century of American intervention in Asia. Her first book, Rhetoric of Empire, took the American decision to embark on overseas empire at the turn of the 20th century and the US intervention in the Boxer Rebellion in China as its focus. That was where the work began. She then moved on to the Chinese Civil War in the late 1940s and the rise of Mao and the People's Republic of China. And finally, she landed in the Korean and the Vietnam Wars. As she moved through these various complex terrains, Marilyn was a founding member of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, a group that among other things would forcefully challenge the reticence of the Association for Asian Studies to speak out in opposition against the Vietnam War. There's also a Madison connection with Maryland. In part, it's her engagement in the historiography of the Nula through the work of William and Appleman Williams, something that we sort of see echoes of in the title that Monica carries into <laughs> her time here. But Maryland was also part of an amazing cohort of scholars based in Madison. Faculty member Tom McCormick and doctoral students Walter Lefebvre and Lloyd Gardner, all of whom became colleagues and friends. The more Asia-focused essays that make up the first half of Making the Forever War can help us see how the region was central in shaping Maryland's broader thinking. Let me give you just a couple of examples there. In the essay, Hard Sell, the Korean War, she examines public doubts about the war in Korea and its acquiescence to the Truman administration's prosecution of the war in the peninsula arguing that the Korean case demonstrated to future administrations, so these are in the lessons learned by administrations categories, demonstrated to future administrations that American wars could in fact be waged without public enthusiasm or public understanding. The same struggle for liberty, another essay in this first section of the volume, explores official American framings of war in Korea and Vietnam to surface what Marilyn calls a persisting American dilemma. Quote, how to acquire an empire without naming it, or better, in the name of the right of self-determination for all peoples. The ironies and the contradictions of America as an anti-colonial power were important threads in Marilyn's work across time space. And a final example, counting the bodies in Vietnam, considers the ways in which the pressing desire of the United States to locate and return American bodies and the virtual disinterest in the bodies of Vietnamese soldiers and civilians, Marilyn arguing reveals whose bodies really count in American assessments 
It's this kind of granular historical work that shaped her emergent conception of forever wars. And it remains generative, I think, for how we think about war in the 20th and the early 21st century. I want to close a little bit by thinking about style. And you might think that style is something that we wouldn't spend all that much time talking about here, that we want to be engaging with the substance of the work. But in a way, it's hard to separate her style from her forms of intellectual and professional scholarly engagement. Marilyn was a New Yorker in the best sense of that word. So if you ask Marilyn to sit down, Marilyn more strenuously stood up. That was essentially <laughs> Marilyn's personality. Also, Marilyn was not shy about speaking truth to power. So I unfortunately was not in the room for this particular conversation. But Marilyn had the opportunity to meet Henry Kissinger just for uh, a little while. <clears throat> now, you know what can happen in these kinds of situations. The great man appears, you get kind of nervous, you know, you mumble some sort of pleasantries. Not Marilyn. Genocide, war criminal, it all came out like right away. Kissinger apparently, you know, looked a little like he was used to kind of sympathetic people around him. Little surprised about where Marilyn went there, but just again, that was kind of how she was in the world. She was a diplomatic historian of the new left, and so she wasn't keen on history that didn't push on what she saw as the various structural failures of American diplomacy. She was an activist and she was a scholar and didn't necessarily see a separation between the two. For her, one informed the other. She was a second wave feminist who led the first consciousness raising session at the University of Michigan, where she was a faculty member in the early 1970s. And she would continue to champion the place of women in the academy in ways large and small throughout her career. And as one of the few women in the field of what was then called US diplomatic history, and this was something that she was delighted to see change over her lifetime, she did not, in her words, suffer pigs gladly. That was all Marilyn. But there was another side to her intellectual and professional engagements as well. She was a war friend and colleague who tirelessly mentored dozens and dozens of us as we came up. And Monica and I both were um, lucky enough to have that kind of attention given to us. And though Marilyn had a politics, she liked people, at least most people, including those across the aisle from her politically. And she often reached out to them. Now, the Kissinger story might not say that the reach out was working all that well, but in general, Marilyn was kind of fearless about who it was she wanted to talk about things with and was respectful in doing so. She engaged with people and in some cases were mentoring people that again, their politics, their views of the world were very different from hers. It's probably just as well that she didn't live to see the insurrection. Had she, I'm guessing she would have called it out for what it was. And to be honest, I don't imagine that she would have been reaching across the aisle to the Make America Great folks. On the fall of Kabul, I can only imagine she would have pushed on Biden and Lincoln, and at the same time pushed back really hard on the retrospective and often exculpatory musings of the Bush national security team. But when the battle was done, her ideal would have been to invite somebody over for a drink or a scotch, and maybe out for a nice Italian dinner in the opera, no matter how heated the discussion had got. As I say, Marilyn basically liked people and she liked an engaged life and it made her work as a scholar richer and more fully formed. It seems to me in these difficult days when we don't always know how to talk to one another across a whole number of divides, that it is both the substance of Marilyn's work and the style or affect by which she made her way in the world that can offer us something of a <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out here on a Friday afternoon. Um, so I'm Monica Kim. I'm a faculty member over here in the history department. Um, this is actually my very first event that I have in person um, at University of Wisconsin-Madison. So it's great to be here with all of you. Previously, I was at NYU, actually. 
Um, and that's where um, Marilyn um, really became um, a dear friend, colleague, and also mentor. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, my relationship with her, but also um, after reading this kind of incredible collection actually of her work and her essays, um, been thinking a lot about, uh, about teaching, about the classroom, and, and again, thinking about Marilyn as a mentor and as a teacher and, and what we can glean from these essays that Mark and Mary have put together for us so wonderfully. So when I remember Marilyn, um, I think of somebody who was incredibly generous and also curious in spirit. She really was a scholar who mentored two generations of women scholars in the field of diplomatic history, which was um, not necessarily a field that was incredibly diverse um, when she first entered the field. And another thing about um, the book that, uh, that really, for me, means a lot is that how much it conveys the kind of sharp wit <laughs> and, and humor and the kind of agility that Marilyn had in terms of speaking truth to power um, and the ways that she was able to um, move in terms of different kinds of cultural spheres in a single essay to show us the sheer scope and depth of how U.S. empire um, really penetrates society and social consciousness. So to me, these writings really convey how effective Marilyn's voice was in demonstrating how to write critical historical analyses from what we could call the belly of the beast, right? So writing as a member of the American body politic as a US citizen um, who is implicated in the ongoing violent project of US empire. So for her diplomatic history, and I think this is what was very key for me, um, I was really coming from um, a couple of different divergent sort of, I guess you could say, political genealogies in the academy. That was very much also a result of Cold War politics in the university in, that, in the 1960s. So on one hand, I was really coming from you know, critical Asian American studies, right? From the student movement of the 1960s that really articulated a political solidarity across the Pacific and also um, in terms of the third world solidarity and also an anti anti-colonial, anti-imperial critique. Um, and then Marilyn was really laying the ground in terms of what Mark has um, told us about, about critical Asian studies. And so um, for, for Marilyn and, and me, um, so many of our conversations um, really came back to those kinds of formative moments in the 1960s about what those uh, kind of movement building and thinking about politics within, again, the belly of the beast of the Cold War University um, now means for our scholarship today. And for me, Marilyn's work um, in terms of diplomatic history, it's perhaps a bit different than what we would consider um, to be kind of mainstream assumptions about diplomatic history, where you kind of imagine a very top-down, right, kind of elite story um, of who is in, in power. For Marilyn, diplomatic history was, um, to, do um, to do diplomatic history was a political activity. It was about holding those in power accountable, but also by writing it, right, by, um, by holding those in power accountable, you are also holding yourself accountable um, as part of kind of the larger project. And so that kind of, um, work and, and scholarship that was so conscious of thinking of oneself um, not simply as a scholar but as somebody who is part of the political stakes right um, and how M u.s empire is impacting the world today was really key for myself as a junior scholar um, starting out at nyu also in terms of the diplomatic history that marilyn presents to us um, there's a way in which, um, and this is something I think a lot about um, in, in my teaching. So there's a way in which that US empire, you know, the consolidation of the national security state, there's a, it seems as if the levers of power and warfare are, are really distant <laughs> from, from those who are part of the mainstream public. Um, and rather than accepting that as inevitable, I believe that Marilyn really is trying to bring the workings of US warfare and decision-making to the ground. So 
in that um, chapter nine um, that we had all read, the way that she breaks down, these are the lessons learned and not learned, right? And she makes it seem as if it's a very, it's actually very mundane and bringing our attention back to these are people, right? Who are making these decisions. So all of that has really um, informed uh, a lot of my own teaching in the classroom and I'm teaching, of course, American Foreign Relations this semester. And I'm actually, uh, I am assigning a few chapters from this book in there. So for me as a teacher um, with American Foreign Relations, uh, this book helps me to do a few different things. And I would really love to hear from those of you who are students, whether undergrad or graduate, um, what you found to be useful you know, in that particular chapter that you had read for today. So the first thing is how Marilyn helps us pay attention to warfare. And for Marilyn, when you go into one of any of these essays, she moves so adeptly between, let's say, um, Hollywood films to policymakers to then military generals and technologies of bombing. And this really brings to the fore, even though it seems like it was with such ease that Marilyn can do this in one essay, it really brings to the fore that to study empire, it is a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary endeavor because empires are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, in fact, right? So she really brings that to the fore in a way that I feel is incredibly engaging um, and really opens up different entry points for, for students. So again, for her, in terms of how to pay attention to empire, you need to develop multiple ways of seeing any one particular phenomenon. The next thing that um, I, I find really uh, compelling and important in my teaching with uh, Marilyn's work is how she always leaves open the question of the American public. And what I mean by that is that on one hand, she's really distilling kind of fundamental logics of empire, right? How empire um, in a kind of solipsistic fashion explains itself to itself, right? Um, so she's kind of interrupting that. On the other hand, she is also so good at capturing the nuances of public ambivalence and dissent. Um, for example, um, there's a chapter here on, on the Korean War where she makes the argument that actually, if you look at um, expressions of dissent um, during the Korean War and after, there was just as much dissent um, during the Korean War as there was in Vietnam. And that's kind of a huge thing <laughs> to be, that, that really disrupts so much of kind of mainstream ideas about Korean War versus Vietnam War versus uh, World War II. But I, I do think that um, the way that she keeps on coming back to the American public is, is really important. And for myself, as a teacher in the classroom right now, um, I just actually, for this semester, I've assigned two chapters. One is about um, where Marilyn analyzes sort of both the literal and then the kind of discourse around the body count and how that has worked across different um, imperial wars for the US. And the other one that I've assigned is actually one about bombing. And, um, and really that how, how if you look at bombing, it just increases the kind of scale and scope of warfare to not simply combatants, but obviously also civilians. And she brings that all the way to drone warfare today. So I've assigned those two because um, for my undergraduates, um, they're primarily a generation that has grown up in a post 9-11 landscape of war, right? Um, and this landscape of war, if we were to kind of historicize it and um, encapsulate it, it's a, a landscape of war where this idea of clean and precise warfare actually has become sort of the paradigmatic mode of warfare. So it's about drone warfare, certain kinds of quote unquote clean tactics of interrogation techniques at Gitmo, extraordinary rendition. This has all become the vocabulary of US liberal warfare. So those two essays by Marilyn, um, I hope, is going to enable me to have a conversation with my undergraduate students about thinking, okay, <laughs> what how do we, um, if we are living in a moment of institutionalized permanent warfare, 
right? Um, how do we even begin kind of, again, doing what Marilyn is doing, which is to interrupt the logics and also interrupt it in such a way that we can create a, an opportunity and a moment for thinking about how public dissent, public consciousness, and mass action could even be possible. Um, gosh, I could go on and on. I want to make sure I'm not taking up too much time. Um, the very, uh, the last thing I, I will um, mention regarding uh, this book and, and teaching for me um, is that it also, Marilyn was just so good in these essays um, at really getting at the character of, of how in US empire, you, you refer to one war only by referring to another war. There's a certain kind of palimpsest kind of nature of how um, US uh, policymakers and elites and generals talk about US warfare. So that US exceptionalism requires the US to refer to their own wars solely in order to frame future and current wars. And so interrupting also that kind of loop, um, she has this great um, opening line, I can't remember which chapter it was, um, where she says, it seems like the United States can only wage two kinds of war, World War II and Vietnam, <laughs> right? Um, and by doing that, she kind of immediately exposes, right, um, just how um, heavy handed and even predetermined, right, um, the language is for describing war that the US um, mobilizes. So I'm going to perhaps stop there. Um, and, uh, and I can talk a bit more also during Q&A if anyone is talking a bit more about the pedagogical self of 30 um, other scholars who are graduate students um, and, and faculty members on a syllabus um, dedicated to ending the Um, and thinking of logics, and also in the speak um, some other scholars of uh, building consciousness on a war like the Korean War that has not officially ended. So I'm really open to um, talking to all of you about that process. Also, thank you. Oh, no. um, I said if Marilyn were told to sit down, she'd stand up. I mean, that money meant. <laughs> <laughs> I met uh, Marilyn Young back in the 1960s <clears throat> when we were both not colleagues, but actually comrades through our involvement in an academic anti war mobilization called CCAS which Mark mentioned, the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars. That was part of a wave of dissident academic groups like Historians Against the War, ERPI, the Union of Radical Political Economists, NACLA, the North American Congress, Conference on Latin America, and, and many others. Now, back then in CCAS, our main task was to apply our knowledge, such as it might be, as supposed Asian area specialists, to a deeper understanding of the Vietnam War and thereby we hoped, hoped to encourage a more informed public debate and in our dreams, encourage a US withdrawal from Vietnam. Now in the 40 years that followed the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, Maryland dissected the conflicts that followed, <clears throat> including the continuing uh, Cold War, the global war on terror, the invasion of Iraq and the seemingly forever war in Afghanistan. The formal end of that forever war in Afghanistan just six days ago on September 11th, 2021, allows us a kind of Archimedean lever to re reflect in ways which Marilyn certainly would have done were she still with us, and to do so by asking <clears throat> why has war remained such a central part of US foreign policy from our conquest of the Philippines in 1898 through World War II and right up to our 
emerging conflict with China. In probing American wars from the Philippine War of 1898 all the way to the invasion of Iraq, and I think all of them, all of us, caught up in the relentless cycle of conflict, had the kind of intellectual space to probe for some underlying causality to explain this endless succession of wars. Maryland described them eloquently, but none of us really explained why this might have been going on. So let's all take advantage of this, this little tiny moment in time. This illusory end to our forever war, this momentary space between withdrawal from Afghanistan and the impending escalation of conflict with China over the Western Pacific, to use <clears throat> that slippery tool that eludes most foreign policy experts. I speak, of course, of geopolitics. Now, this is a really slippery concept. It's rather like the grease on the handle of one of those giant wrenches that engineers used to use to tune their locomotives. But I've applied it, I've tried to apply it <clears throat> to the past 700 years of history from the Black Death of 1350 through the coming climate crisis of 2050. So I've tried to use it in the past, but let's see if we can use geopolitics to probe the present and <clears throat> explain an evolving diplomatic shift to this historical moment. Now, <clears throat> in a century plus since the United States first pushed across the Pacific. Washington has tried to balance three geopolitical components. A vast ocean, a volatile island littoral stretching from Japan to the Philippines, and a populous Eurasian continent. In the continuing struggle to control the strategic frontier, Washington has been at war somewhere in the Asia Pacific region for 50 out of the last 80 years. And just as Portugal's global empire was synonymous with its dominion over the Indian Ocean, so America's has been, and likely will be, shaped by its experience in the Pacific. Back in 1904, <clears throat> that master, some would say the creator of modern geopolitics, the Victorian geographer, Alfred Mackinder, argued that global power rested on a relentless struggle for dominance over something he called the world island, which he defined as a tri-continental landmass comprising the three plus continents of Europe, Asia, and very importantly, Africa. <clears throat> Indeed, for the past 500 years, each global hegemon in succession, Portugal, Holland, Britain, the United States, and now China, has deployed its strategic forces around this tricontinental world island in a bid to dominate that vast landmass and to it the world beyond. America's first push across the Pacific in 1898 to capture the Philippines at the edge of Eurasia, plunge it into four decades of competition with Japan over the Western Pacific. A competition that was resolved during World War II when the US captured the entire Pacific and its island littoral from Japan to the Philippines and Australia. As Oxford University historian John Darwin has explained, Washington achieved what he called its colossal imperium on an unprecedented scale after World War II by becoming the first power in history to control the strategic axial ends of what he called both ends of Eurasia. That is in the context of the Cold War by forging the NATO alliance in Europe and signing four bilateral defense pacts along the Asian Pacific littoral with Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and Australia. In the Cold War's final chapter, <clears throat> when the Red Army occupied Kabul in Afghanistan in December 1979, the U.S. National Security Advisor, Zygmunt Brzezinski, who, by the way, was a, a self-taught master of Alfred McKinder's geopolitical theory, crafted a grand strategy for a CIA covert war that would take a decade to force the Red Army to retreat in humiliating defeat from Afghanistan. <clears throat> now, during the first two decades of what was really a 40-year involvement in Afghanistan, Brzezinski's initial <clears throat> and skillful geopolitical alignment of the global forces through an alignment of China and Pakistan gave the U.S. two great victories, first over the Soviet Union in 1989 and then over the Taliban government in 2001. But then came China's challenge to U.S. global power. Speaking at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan, which by the way is a fraternal university for us here at University of Wisconsin-Madison, this program gets a lot of money from Nazarbayev University. We're building their social sciences just soon. <clears throat> so there was Xi Jinping at our fraternal university. And he announced 
though nobody in Washington was listening. China's strategy for winning the 21st edition of the deadly great dream that 19th century empires had once played for control over Central Asia, which Halford McKinder had dubbed the geopolitical pivot for control over the entire Eurasian landmass. With gentle gestures that belied his imperious intent, President Xi asked that academic audience to join him in building an economic belt along the Silk Road, connecting the Pacific and Baltic Sea, and thus build the biggest market in the world with unparalleled potential. Now, in the 10 years since that speech, <clears throat> China has been, under its so-called Belt and Road Initiative, engaged in nothing less than history's largest infrastructure project, 10 times the size of the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe at the end of World War II, crisscrossing those three continents with rails and pipelines, building naval bases around the southern rim of Asia, and ringing the entire tri-continental world island, Asia, Europe, and Africa, with a string of 40 major commercial ports. Responding to the China challenge in late 2017, President Trump and India's Prime Minister Modi joined with their Australian and Japanese counterparts to form what was called the Quad, or the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue among like-minded Indo-Pacific democracies, words that soon gained substance through <clears throat> joint naval maneuvers among these four powers in the Indian Ocean. Now, within weeks of that meeting, Trump trashed that 50-year US alliance with Pakistan in a New Year's Day tweet saying that Pakistan had repaid years of generous USA with what he called nothing but lies and deceit. And through that diplomatic shift, Trump made the US withdrawal from Afghanistan a geopolitical imperative. Above all, the Taliban's victory just last month effectively forces Washington out of Central Asia and consolidates Beijing's capture of this strategic region, which is nothing less than the geopolitical pivot for China's dominance over the vast Eurasian landmass, home to 70% of the world's population and productivity. In response, <clears throat> the Biden administration, as we know from an announcement yesterday, has shifted US forces to the Pacific, signing a nuclear submarine agreement with Australia. And in a simultaneous and rather surprising bit of unremarked bipartisan continuity, illustrating just how geopolitics is really shaping US foreign policy, the Biden administration announced that Trump's quad of democratic powers will be meeting for more Indian Ocean maneuvers to check China in that strategic sea. America's <clears throat> unequaled air and sea armada still allow a rapid movement above and around these continents, as the mass evacuation of 120,000 people from Kabul showed so forceful. But the slow, inch by inch advance of China's land based steel rib infrastructure across the world islands, deserts, and mountains represents a far more fundamental form of control. <clears throat> As the stunning success of China's geopolitical capture of Afghanistan shows with such clarity, there is still much wisdom in the words that Sir Herbert McKinder wrote just a little bit over a century ago. He said, who rules the world island commands the world. To that we might add after watching Washington's recent experience in Afghanistan, who does not command the world island cannot command the world. But the struggle <clears throat> in all of its geopolitical twists and turns continue. Watch this space. Thank you. Um, I think the idea is to open things up to you all and to see what's on your minds and um, have a discussion. There's something I want to ask Monica about, but I, I, I'll open it up and come back to that because we do talk for quite some time, as it turns out. So what of all this struck you that you'd like to talk about issues you'd like to put on the table? Any written questions you want to pass up? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, good afternoon. Uh, before I ask a question, uh, a, a question, I would like to inform you that I am a new, a new student student. So thank you for coming here to talk about the war. And and I I I, I work with a large number of 
feel like the victims and innocent people are not being respected because, you know, like Cambodia, we call it as a secret war by the U.S. So, so the, the, the documents are being classified and nobody can learn. Just like the war, uh, the 9-11 victims who, who do not understand, who do not, who do not uh, who couldn't, couldn't access to the, the classified documents to understand why 9-11 happened to those people. So, I mean, like, uh, for the people, for all of you sitting here, you've learned a lot to understand what caused the war, but what would be the, the best message to the victims of the war so they can, uh, so they can begin uh, the process of healing? Because without learning what happened to them, I don't think that they can process their healing. They are living in suffering uh, from, from, from the beginning until, as I, I read uh, in uh, Al McCoy quote in the Jack memory, we, we fight the first war, and then still we are still having the second war. Mm -hmm. So so this is my question. I'm, I'm sorry if I made any mistake, and I just want to learn, and then because I engage with the people who are the victims of the war, so I sometimes I don't know what to tell them. Because, because this is the, so critical. So thank you. You know, it's a really great question, and it's a really hard question um, to think about and understand the experience of victims and to pose the notion that there would be something that could be said that would make people understand in one form or another. I don't know, in fact, whether that's possible. I mean, there are ways that people could come to understand more critically the decisions that the United States made in Cambodia, in Vietnam, that might or might not help people understand in the larger sense that you mean, right? It could, you could see pieces, but not so much the whole. Um, I do know that one thing that Marilyn was engaged in, and in, in some ways so was I, and this is less, I'll confess, around Cambodia, but more around Vietnam, but it's the same issues in a way, just in a different place. Um, is, is trying to think about the question of memory after the war is over. Because you can't really easily divide questions of history and memory, right? Um, people try to do that sometimes, but I don't think that really works in the end. And in the conversations that she and I were having with people, it was often people who were not necessarily um, you know, everyday people on the ground, so I confess that. Um, but they weren't with academics either, or policymakers. But it was in the world of the arts. So people who write fiction, or people who write short stories, or people who create, um, you know, using visual medium in one form or another to reflect both on experience and meaning. And Again, I don't need to speak for her, but I can speak for myself in saying that that's helped me come closer to understanding an experience that I can never fully understand than any of the traditional historical work that I've done. Talking to people helps too, right? But even in those conversations, it's hard, right? To talk to people necessarily, for people to have confidence in you, be able to say all the things that they might say. And so in a work of literature or in a work of the arts, there's sometimes an honesty that comes through that's just complicated to navigate if you're thinking about it with you know, an individual one-on-one. -on -one. And I would say that collectively, some of that work, at least around the Vietnamese diaspora around the world, but the Cambodian diaspora too, because there are plenty of Cambodian visual artists who are doing absolutely fascinating work that immediately goes back to the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot period. That they're beginning to shape a popular consciousness about the wars that's very, very different than the kinds of stories that historians were telling, historians of the West were 
So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very vague answer to an important question that's super hard to answer. But I, I think that the imaginative space, and that could be a religious space as well, right, is ultimately where that understanding is going to be worked out in one form or another. Marilyn did some of that work on the American side. She was interested in um, popular culture, as Monica talked about, as a way to, to thinking about something. Um, maybe not so much in terms of in Cambodian society or in Vietnamese society. But as I say, others, I think, have gone there in, in interesting kinds of ways. So I don't know if that helps you at all. But I appreciate the question. <clears throat> uh, speaking of, of fallen comrades, um, the only person I knew at the time that actually was conscious of this issue, uh, who was trying to serve as kind of a bridge between the communities of victims and the anti-war movement and the <clears throat> wider American community, was a departed activist and good friend of mine named Fred Bramfman. And Fred, uh, in order to beat the draft, joined up with something called International Voluntary Services, IVS, which was kind of a Christian fundamentalist peace corps. Uh, and uh, he got assigned in a village in rural Laos. He became pretty fluent in Lao. Um, and uh, he, as the refugees started coming down from the Plain of Jars, he went into the camps. And then he did something extraordinary. He decided that he wanted to hear their voices. And, you know, in the reportage, the, the billions upon billions of words that were written about the Indochina War, uh, it was all fo very fo much focused on maybe talking to U.S. combatants, U.S. soldiers, but all talking to the command and trying to figure out the policy and the events, okay? And so this idea, in the midst of this, all, all of this, this, as the bombing was ongoing, the biggest air war in human history was still rumbling onward. Fred went into refugee camps. He identified refugees who were willing to talk, who were deeply traumatized. Their village, they'd lived under bombardment for months. Their villages had been smashed. They'd retreated into caves. The daylight bombing uh, was followed by the nighttime bombing, but there was a couple hours in twilight that you could go out and you could farm and provision. And, you know, and then uh, after years of this, they couldn't do it anymore and they would have to start walking. And when they started walking, of course the air war above them particularly with the spooky gunships, all they did was sniff for mammal urine. And when they smelled it in the dark, they fired, and the people were slaughtered in the march. So these were people that were profoundly, deeply traumatized by the time the few survivors made it to these refugee camps in the U.S. God zone. Fred went in there, and he had them draw what they'd witnessed, and he had them write accounts. And they're powerfully emotional. And they were published at the time, very small book, you know, Voices from the Plain of Jars. And, and it was brought back, and now it's actually been adopted by the Lao community in the United States. They've, they've, they, it, you know, they've created a foundation, they have a kind of campaign, the legacies of war, okay, and they, they publicized it, and I think that probably played a role in getting Obama, to, when he went to Laos, to actually acknowledge that and increase the funding for the UXB removal and begin to engage the trauma of that society. So that's one of the very few people I know that did that at the time. And it's a kind of model for us all, because it combines, you know, he's a skilled writer, and he had access to publisher. He had people, ordinary villagers, write their accounts in Laos, draw the pictures, and then he, he translated them and published them. And that's one of the very few successful attempts, I think, of, of bridging, giving voice to that trauma in a way that in this society was useful in having this society come back and trying to address that on the ground. So I, I wanted to just to ask one thing about Monica, and I think it kind of builds on a question a little bit, and that's this syllabus project about ending the Korean War, right? Because ending a war that, you know, has been going on since, well, since, it seems to me wrapped up in this whole kind of idea. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you so much for your question. Um, it's so I don't think this is necessarily something that one would say um, to, um, to the people you are working with. But one thing that it certainly um, immediately you know, evokes 
for me um, in thinking about the Korean War um, is that, and I think Maryland and everyone up here would agree with this, is that any American war is actually many wars. There are many wars in a war. And what I mean by that is that for, for Cambodian um, American people who are in the US, and for that to that history to be entirely not um, publicly known, right? Um, that in itself is a form of US empire working. And it's a form of kind of a violence and um, a legacy of ongoing war in a sense, right? So the kind of disorientation, um, the trauma, all of that is not something that happened post-war, but it, that actually is it's part of a continuing kind of form of, of war. Um, and that's one of the things about um, that public syllabus that um, a group of us are working on um, that we're really trying to um, build a syllabus that really effectively conveys that, that it's not simply about the afterlife of war, right? Um, that, for example, with the Korean War, there's, it supposedly ended in 1953, but that was only a ceasefire that was signed. And so there's a demand for an actual peace treaty um, to come to the table. Um, but aside from, you know, the larger, there is a very large question of, well, you know, do we want, what kind of peace then do we want, right? Which is a very important question, right? If it looks like a hyper-militarized peace, is that necessarily peace, right? Um, but the other kind of more everyday question, right? Um, especially for thinking about um, what the Korean War has done for the national security state and the military, and also um, the Korean American diaspora, that this is a war that is absolutely on ongoing, right? Um, and that you can find um, the, the legacies of, of war in the most ordinary forms, like in food, right? Or um, in, in forms like, and so anyways, it, it's, um, I think that that also goes to something um, that I think um, Marilyn would have very deeply appreciated, which is how do we challenge ourselves again in terms of how we pay attention to where war is, right? Um, and can we look at something ordinary and everyday, whether it's the ordinary people, right, of the insurrection and taking seriously um, their, their particular political sort of paths, let's say, right? Or in terms of thinking about, um, you know, U.S. empire and how it affects um, something as simple as either what you consume or the actual social relations one has day to day, right? So, um, so yes, I don't exactly have something that you could necessarily bring back, um, but um, but to say that um, that I think that especially for um, diasporic um, peoples who are um, are. are having to force, you know, basically having no choice but to um, migrate to the United States because the United States actually is, <laughs> came to them, right? Um, that it really, uh, it, it really raises the, the important question of like, where we begin and where we end in, in terms of looking at war. Yeah. Hi, I'm also a new graduate student. Um, my name is Tsai. I'm also a uh, child of refugee. I was born on a refugee camp, actually, in Nong Kai, in Thailand. Um, <clears throat> my question is, um, I, I have a perspective on that, too, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, but uh, maybe I'll get my perspective first and then get my question. My perspective is um, the way that I see Hmong people, actually the, the question might be better first, okay, because I haven't read this book yet, so, um, but what is the Marilyn's perspective, or Marilyn Young's perspective, or, or your perspectives on uh, communism in the sense of, um, yeah, I think you, was it Mark? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were kind of getting to like her uh, thinking about North Vietnam. Um, but that she didn't speak the language, but that she, um, you know, maybe through an interpreter have conversations with those who were uh, maybe uh, on the ground. But 
what I'm trying to get at is, isn't the, the perspective is that there is like a xenophobia or the threat of communism, but would you say that communism, or is her perspective that there's not another empire building coming from the other side with the whole idea of proxy war, right, from the, the uh, communism side? Because a lot of us are victims of uh, communist leaders who have, you know, imposed violence through, through their regimes. And so um, I'm wondering, like, what is that perspective? Is it more about if they didn't, like, if the United States did not get involved with the war, is there a, a possibility that communism could spread um, and, like, that, you know, people like us who stayed in these countries would be under uh, communist rule, right? Um, and so, so that's one complexity that I'm wondering about. And also, um, she was going to say. Uh, so, going back to uh, what he referenced, I think like for us, growing up, they told us that the communists were the enemies, right? Because my parents flee communism, and my relatives were killed by communists from North Vietnam and North Laos. But then when I grew up, I mean, as an adult, and really understanding and getting to know other Hmong people who grew up in Vietnam, for example, and actually interacting with them, I knew that we were just recruited. They were recruited on the Vietnam, or their grandparents were recruited on the Vietnamese side, and my grandparents were recruited on the American side. And so we were pitted against each other. So for me, the way I see it is, I'm not trying to understand all the political complexity. I mean, I am, but as far as the, my, my people healing, I'm, it's more about us not trying to understand that we were uh, basically split up and pitted against each other um, because of this proxy war, right? And that's the way I, I understand it, and the, our healing is more about us seeing it as that versus trying to understand the, all the complexities of the war is what I'm saying. But me as an individual, I would like to understand the complexities of it. And so, so going back to that question, um, yeah, what, what is that perspective? What, what is that response to, to is, it, is it a threat and is it empire building on the other side, the communism side? Yeah, there's a lot of that question. Um, let me just go in two directions because I Mary is looking over at me and I'm looking at the time and we can talk more you know, sure. um, when we're done. But I think there's there's at least two ways of thinking about what you're asking. And one of them is more kind of on the ground and one of them is more sort of scholarly, I think. And I don't mean to privilege one better, one worse, but just that um, the argument that there was another empire is an argument that I think people would take more seriously in the academic world than they did during the war because many of the people essentially who were involved in anti-war protests in this country were people who had been tarred as communists you know, domestically, right? So they had a fraught relationship with our government and what that meant and what that would happen. And so, in some ways, we're willing to look not so much at the Soviet Union, but I think at China and at Vietnam in ways that, you know, I'll be kind of delicate about it, like accentuated the positive and didn't really look at what was underneath some of it, right? I mean, people didn't talk about the Great Leap Forward. People didn't talk about the famine. People didn't talk about a whole host of things that people didn't talk about. Um, and some of that had to do with the fact that, you know, just with Vietnamese studies in the United States or Cambodian Vietnamese Laos studies in the United States in the 1960s, that it was almost non existent in terms of who, you know, was there, who had language, who had experience, who had knowledge. Um, in France, there was much more expertise than there would have been. So people were dealing with a pretty limited, you know, 
here. And I always remember my advisor at Harvard, Kwe Tam Ho Chai, told me this story about she was at Brandeis as an undergrad during the 60s. There was some big anti-war protest movement in, uh, at Harvard. There were many, but this was one. She was there. And there was this guy who was a dental student at Harvard who was up explaining about the um, nature of Vietnamese history. Well, you know, Tam Thai, like, she'd grown up in Vietnam. Her dad was a leader in the Bahau movement. They, they knew, you know, civil society pretty well. And there was this guy, you know, this like white guy from Teaneck, New Jersey, that was busily explaining to her, no, it's like this, really, right? So it was just like a moment when I, I think people didn't have much of a sense of the three-dimensionality of all of that at all in this country. Um, but, and so I think some of Maryland sort of like after the fact, like, wow, I didn't really have it right about what the North Vietnamese state was about, I think was a reaction to that and acknowledgement of that. But the other piece of it is, I don't know that that then would have changed people's views of the South Vietnamese state, right? So what we've come to know over the last decade or so is the kind of richness of civil society in South Vietnam during the period after 1945. You know, that history was not written, and it is beginning to be written now. And so writing off southern Vietnam as a place that's just, you know, a kind of like anti-communist puppet state, it's harder to do now, because you understand who was in that state and the kind of politics they had and what they wanted to do. But at the level of the state, at the level of the state actually being, you know, a fully functioning state, I think people would be quite they'd be less willing to, you know, significantly revise how they thought about that. So you put that back in the picture. So now the North Vietnamese state, we need to think of very differently than say we did during the war. But maybe what we're learning about the South Vietnamese state in some ways is reinforcing kind of what we thought about the state, even at the same time, it's helping us understand that civil society again had this kind of capaciousness to it. And so then you know, if there was a design down south, as many people think there was in the south, given the way the state looked, what was the likely outcome, right? And this is where, you know, it's dangerous as a historian. We don't know, right? It's all here. Yeah. But it, it, there's a really terrific new book that's just come out by Sean McHale. He's at Georgetown. He's, uh, excuse me, George Washington University, Vietnamese historian. Sean's writing about the first war, the French war, and about the ways in which South Vietnam became almost permanently factualized as a result of that war. Permanently what? Permanently factualized. Right. And that factualization <clears throat> was partially around religious sectarian movements and their armies, but that factualization was also about the unstable relationship between Cambodia and South Vietnam and Khmer in Vietnam and not, and just the incredible fractures and fluidities that emerged with a vengeance at the beginning of the French War. So that people were being murdered in just unbelievable kinds of ways in the South in the first two years of the war by what was the communist movement, but also what was all of these splintered movements that were moving you know, simultaneously around. And he argues in the book, it's a book that really is focused 46 to 54. But in the epilogue, he takes it forward and he says, this was the legacy that the South was dealing with in the American period. And in fact, this was the South that the North was dealing with after 1975 and has only partially been successful in their own efforts in putting, you know, that state back together in a non-factionalized way. So you get into that kind of, again, sort of long, granular history and how that pulls forward. And some of the communist, anti-communist stuff comes down a bit, I think, because on the ground, as he's describing all of these fractures, communism is in the mix, for sure. But so are a host of other things that don't go away either, right? Even after it's all done. And that's where, you know, we're just in a really privileged position now than we were in the 1960s and the 1970s. I say that as American scholars, about 
a much more three-dimensional sense about the history of these places that were largely unknown to Americans or when talked about, talked about in these broad brush ways that come to, that have to come to, that you don't have to know very much, right? It's just, you know there's labels that you just kind of put in your life. But the situation on the ground, as it always is, is so much more complicated, but it takes a lot of people and it takes a lot of work and it takes archives and it takes um, oral history and it takes a whole host of things, you know, to be able to begin to get there. Mike, could I speak on behalf of the the anonymous Dennis from Kiernet, New Jersey. Um, uh, at the time, a lot of people like that who had no particular expertise, uh, because we all had skin in the game, the draft, and you were going to go fight in that war, and we now know what that means. But at the time, a lot of people did actually know what that means. And um, it was to be in a village, armed, the pervasiveness of the atrocity, the, the, even in the most benign level, dropping down a NATO-style U.S. highly mechanized army in a flangeal, bamboo, girded South Vietnamese society was going to be a collision, and it was a tragic collision. And the, the extraordinary number of South Vietnamese deaths killed by American soldiers is testimony to this, you know, half a million at least. Uh, <clears throat> so, so, you know, people like the, dirt, the Dennis from Jersey, in order to challenge the, the government and challenge the draft and challenge public support for the war, I would say to their credit, began reading the limited sources they had available, trying to inform themselves about the society. And thus, by informing themselves, at least taking a position at the time, that Dennis didn't have the luxury of knowing or waiting 70 years to figure out what was maybe going on in the 60s. Okay, so, um, so, so people did that, and you know, and then they spoke publicly to their peers about the issue, and uh, in that process there were a tremendous number of mistakes made. The most common mistake is people that became the most dedicated and war activists. Somehow, in the binary idea of a war you have to pick a side, they picked the other side. They, uh, they romanticized the other side, they, uh, and that included Cambodia. And there was a, by a number of scholars who would be nameless, I uh, won't mention their names, but we know who they are. They made terrible mistakes in valorizing Pol Pot's regime and in feeling it was a liberation government, that his rural reform was a bold socialist experiment. I mean, uh, 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 this was, you know, this was, these were serious scholars who read language and were thinking, but they had partial information. And they were a victim of this kind of binary approach. Right? Not everybody did that. But that was a very common reaction. They're recoiling from your awareness of the excesses of your own government and transposing your aspirations for a better world to the other side, about which very little was known. That was a, a, one of many, many mistakes the anyone movement made. And we don't have time to go through all the rest of them, but they're legion. And, and, uh, they are. And I'll just say with the dentist from Kinek, and again, I feel bad for this guy. I've never met the dentist from Kinek, but. <laughs> Who um, stand for all of us but, at the time? Yeah, but, but so, so Wayne Hotai goes up to the dentist from Kinek after it's done and says, you know, actually it's a little more complicated on the ground in South Vietnam. They talk a little bit and he says, you know, you sound bourgeois to me. <laughs> the person who's going to be the dentist from Kinek. Um, and I don't really have a lot of interest in what you're telling me about South Vietnam. That's worth thinking. Maybe I shouldn't have spoken so fully for the, on behalf of the dentist routine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. We'll, um, talk, we'll talk more, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Um, I think we're, we're way over time, Mary is telling me. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks for the great questions. Uh, it was really, I think it was so great to do something in person. Um, thanks to everybody. Appreciate it.